Psalm 15 on today as we continue our emphasis or our thought and lifting up the notion that it's not about me, but it's all about him. Psalm 15 is going to be our point of emphasis on today. Psalm 15, um, in contrast to Psalm 14, David is writing in a way that really offsets the two Psalms when taken together. In Psalm 14, if you remember, he's describing an individual um, who is a sinner acting as if there is no God. But in Psalm 15, the notion that's being put forth is that not only is there a God, but it's all about him. What David does in a Q&A style is he unpacks the heart of a disciple who is interested in dwelling with God, one who wants to be close to God one who wants to be invited by God into his tent and dwell with him, live with him, have his existence with him. Better yet, it describes the attitude of one who is after God's own heart, much like David is described in other passages. And when we live in this way, when we live according to the, the elements and the teaching in Psalm 15, what we are really saying is that it's not about me. But it is all about him. And when you and I live in a way that says it's all about him, it will affect our hearts. It will affect our habits. It will affect our wants. It will affect our ways. What David does in this in the structure of the psalm, 
is in four sets of three. David offers 12 principles in this very short psalm that, are, that will challenge the life of every disciple. In fact, let me just dare you. Let me challenge you. I, I dare you and challenge you to take this text and use it as a missional passage for your character. Use this passage to align your heart, to align your habits, to align your wants, to align your ways, and to do it in a way where, where you literally are telling God in conjunction with this text, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. When you read the psalm and you see the, 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 the emphasis that's put forth in those Three, those four uh, sets and three principles in each set, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Listen to the text. Listen to it. I want to read it out of the Passion Translation, and you'll, you'll hear the import of the text. Listen to it. Lord, who dares to dwell with you? Who presumes the privilege of being close to you, living next to you in your shining place of glory? Who are those who daily dwell in the life of the Holy Spirit? Watch the answer. They are passionate and wholehearted, always sincere and always speaking the truth, for their hearts are trustworthy. They refuse to slander or insult others. They'll never listen to gossip or rumors, nor would they ever harm another with their words. They will speak out passionately against evil and evil workers while commending the faithful ones who follow after the truth. They make firm commitments and follow through, even at great cost. They never crush others with exploitation or abuse, and they would never be bought with a bribe against the innocent. They will never be shaken. They will never or they will stand firm forever. Go back and read that psalm when you get a chance out of the New American Standard. Read it out of the NIV. Read it out of one of your more modern uh, 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 translations. And what you'll find is that over and again, that psalm is reminding us of at least 12 things that are indicated. And, but again, watch the point. The point is that he's asking and answering. That's how the psalm is set up. He's asking and answering. And when you see it unpacked, it's as if the question is being asked to God. God, who lives with you? Who dwells in your tent? Who, who are the people that are close to you? And then God would answer almost in four different ways. Number one, people who have a heart like me. Verse number two, he'll bring you back. And what you'll find is that in this text, God opens up and he gives you three things out of verse number two. He who walks with integrity and works righteous and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. What are you saying, God? He's saying, first of all, number one. In, when you and I want to be a people who dwell with God, we need to learn with, with our God to be a people who have good hearts. And a good heart comes out of one who says, I do what God says. Number first and foremost, my life is lived in a way where the standard for my life is to do what God says. Now watch, because if God's word is what bridles your heart, if God's word is the standard over your heart, then your word or man's word or culture's word or the community's word or the word on the street is not the word that you live by. God's word is what bridles, is what, it what stands, it's what stands to be the word you listen to. But not only am I doing what God says, number two, I do what's right and I I do what's right according to the import of the text all the time. That's called integrity. Integrity is when you and I practice doing the right thing when no one is watching you, when no one is looking at you. I have the right standard, number one. I do what is right, number two. But then in addition to this, people who practice having good hearts, I tell the truth. Oh, I love this because what you find is that in this first verse, these first three emphases is that you know truth, you live truth, you speak truth. Say it back so I know you got it. No truth live truth speak truth telling the truth is an indication that from my heart from what's within me I ensure that I speak truth in notice how he puts the emphasis in his heart why why in his heart because the, the point is that from the core of who I am I tell the truth even when 
It may compromise the what, what everyone else wants around me. Let me just say very quickly, we've got to learn how to get out of the cultural norm that there are many truths. There are not many truths. We've got to get out of the cultural norm where if I tell you the truth, it's going to affect your truth. This is my truth and this is your truth. Stop all that. If everybody has a truth, there are 7.4 or more billion truths and that cannot be the case. There is one truth. And that truth is, is impacting every individual's lives. We can't compromise truth. Why? Because it's what's right. How do you know? Because God gave it. I do what God says. I do what's right even when I'm all alone and I speak the truth. God says people who dwell with me, people who will walk with me, people who show that it's all about me and not about them are those who have good hearts. But then number two is people who have godly habits. Look at the, the next verse, verse three. In verse three, he moves right on and gives you three more. He does not slander with his tongue. He does not do evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up reproach against his friend. Watch these next three. First three again, people who have godly, uh, good hearts, but then number two, people who have godly habits. Habit number one underneath verse number three, don't lie about other people. Notice the emphasis here. A lie is when you willingly state an untruth about somebody else. God is basically saying, you can't claim that it's all about me and speak lies. Why? Because in the nature of who God is, God is truth. And since God is truth, everything that comes out of him is the truth. And you and I have to learn how to not deny, how to not state untruths, how to not willingly, openly, maliciously speak that which is untrue, not just about others, but period. We can't be people who lie. Then on number two in the, in, this, in the second part, don't do anything wrong to others. I love this part. Because the, the lie, speaking lies, is that notion of speaking hurtfully, being willing to state what is untrue. But when you do number two, this godly habit, the second godly habit is doing those things that were wrong. Another, it ought to remind you of Philippians 2 and verse number three. Whenever I do something that were wrong or hurt someone else, I am literally devaluing that which belongs to God. And if God thought enough of people to be in the world, who am I to hurt another? the individual. It is not right. It is not fair. It is not just. It is not of God to hurt someone. One should never press the knee on the neck of another until they die. One should never openly shoot others in the back until they are. Uh, one should never hurt people. One should never speak evil of others. One should never think that someone is less valuable because of the melanin of their skin. That is not of God. And godly people don't do hurtful things. They do not do wrong for others. And when you are disenfranchised, when you are treated like property, when you are hurt, you should not retaliate with wrong because it makes you just as evil and wicked and malicious as the people who did it to you. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't practice having godly habits. We don't lie about others. We don't do wrong about others. And then number three, in this same verse, don't gossip. Oh, please, come here. Come here, all the gossips, pull up your chair. What does this mean? What does gossip mean? Maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe part of the reason why you gossip so much is because you don't know what gossip means. The word gossip is to habitually reveal personal or sensational facts about others, usually with the intent of harm or to spread a negative element about that person. Gossip is to habitually reveal personal or sensational facts about another, usually with the intent of harm to spread or uh, to spread or to uh, to spread a negative element about that person. You can tell person, you can tell when someone is poised to gossip, when you hear phrases like cha I heard, or you can tell when someone is about to gossip, when you hear the phrase, let me give you the tea, or you can tell when someone is about to gossip it, when you hear the phrase, well, what I heard was, and over and over again, and all of that, hear me, child of God, all of that is not of God. You cannot claim 
to say that you are living all about him when you're spreading stuff all about them. You can't claim to be a people who want to honor God with your habits when you habitually are spreading things about individuals that they did not ask you to please proclaim. If they didn't tell you, would you let this word be known? If they didn't tell you, hey, would you share with everybody you know? If they didn't tell you, please share my private stuff. Share the things that would hurt me. Share the things that make me bashful. Would you please uh, uh, say things about me that would cause me to hang my head low? If they didn't ask you to open your mouth and speak about them, then you don't have the right to crack your mouth in any sort of way to say any sort of thing about them. You can't claim that it's all about him when you're talking all about them. I hope you hear that. God is saying then that when we live in such a way where it's all about him, then we don't lie about others. We don't do wrong to others. We don't gossip to others because that's not a people who have good hearts. That's not a people who have godly habits. But then watch the third trilogy or the third trilogy in the text. Verse number four. Verse number four, he says, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Does not change actually goes into the fourth uh, trilogy. But notice these next three. God, who, who is it that dwells with you? Who lives with you? Who, who is it that's living in such a way that it's all about, all about you and not about them? People who have good hearts, people who have good habits, and now number three, people who want what I want. Watch, watch verse number four. In this first four, the, first, the fourth verse here, you see number one, he says, don't honor, celebrate, or respect what God wouldn't. Don't honor people or celebrate or respect what God wouldn't. That's number one. But then number two, right underneath it, honor or celebrate what I would respect or what I would honor. Does that not remind you of 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number six, where, where in that text, Paul describes how love celebrates or love loves the things that God, or the love lifts up things that God would lift up, lift up and deny the things that God would deny. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number six, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Same concept here, except in the emphasis, God is making the, God is making the push that they don't reject people that the Lord, they reject people who the Lord rejects but honor those who follow the Lord we've got to learn how to make sure that we're not on the side of contemporary culture that lifts up or celebrates things that God would not lift up or celebrate be careful about your music be careful about your media be careful about what you read be careful about who you listen to why because you may inadvertently you may subtly be celebrating something that God would not celebrate. God wouldn't listen to every lyric. God would not watch every program. God would not sit in front of and ingest himself on a picture of sexuality. That's not what he would practice. He wouldn't sit and listen to or watch things where folk are harming, openly harming that which is negative. And I get it, I understand, because right now someone's saying, but that's entertainment. You mean to tell me I can't? Listen, all I'm telling you is that you and I have to be careful that we're not programming, wiring, allowing ourselves to ingest and become gratified and become pleased with and to lift up and to laud which that which not that which would not lift our God up. If God wouldn't sit on the couch and sit and have popcorn and eat it with you and watch it with you, then maybe you shouldn't sit there and do it yourself. I know, I know popcorn and chicken and chi uh, chips and all of that and I'm just, it's just mindless while I'm doing what I'm doing. This is my show, child. I'm trying to decompress. I'm trying, maybe you need to do something else to decompress. Maybe you need to do something else to take your mind off of things. Maybe you need to do something else to find where you get your endorphins from. Maybe you need to find do something else to find out where your dopamine uh, supply comes from. Maybe you need to do something that God would have you to do because that's what the next one says. God, you got to learn how to reject what God would reject, but then celebrate what God would celebrate. Ask that question in the positive. God, what is it that gets you excited? What is it that gets you hooked up? What is it that causes you to rejoice? What is it that heaven right this minute is praising and lauding and having a great time about? Those are the things that you and I ought to be after. We ought to be after making sure that we want what he wants. We want how he wants it. We do it the way he does it. And, and then watch the next one. And in order to do that, that makes you look more like God. But then number three, I need to also be a promise keeper. When I tell you I'm going to do something, 
and I, I need to hold up my end of the bargain. I, I need to do it. Verse number four, they keep their promises even when it's hard to do. Let me give you a good rule of thumb with promises. If you know for a fact that you're not going to be able to commit to the time, you're not going to be able to commit to the activity, you're not going to be able to commit to the, to the vow that you've made, then stop making it. You look more like the enemy, like you're lying. You look more like those that don't care about being industrious, those that don't care about having integrity, than you do like God when you say, I can do it, or I will do it, or I will be about it, and then you don't do it, or you don't follow through, or you break someone else's heart. Remember, every time you break another person's heart, you are breaking a child of God's heart. I, I don't care if they're a member of the body of Christ or not. God made them. They belong to God, and you're breaking their heart. You're either breaking their heart as a member of covenant or you're breaking their heart as a member of community that needs to be in covenant. Either way, you're hurting something or someone that belongs to God and we cannot be those type of people. Let me move on. Number four, God, who is it that dwells with you? Who lives in your tent? Who gets invited to a meal with you? People, people who have good hearts, people who have godly habits, People who want what I want. And then number four, people with ways like me. This fifth trilogy, the first one is at the end of verse four, four D, the D clause of verse number four. Number one, people who don't change, people who don't switch up, people who don't put out money with interest. And then last, number three, people who don't take a bribe against innocence. Watch these last three. The first one, he says, people who have ways like me. God, what, what, what ways are you talking about? Number one, stop switching up on people. Don't change on people. Don't be one way one day and another day the other day. Be reliable. That's the emphasis of the text. Be reliable. God wants you and I to have character like him. If we're really going to live in such a way where we say it's all about God, then you need to be consistent. That's the emphasis here. Be consistent. Why in the world would I be consistent to be like God? Why would I do that to say I'm like God? Well, maybe it's because the Bible says over and over again, God does not change. You you can rely on who your God is. He's always going to be loving, always going to be truthful. The Bible makes a statement, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. They are new every morning. Great is our faithfulness. But you and I have people in our life where we wonder, who are you going to be today? Who are you today? When I wake up, are you going to still be that same individual? Or or better yet, they, they never get around. They'll switch up depending on who they are around. Do they love you when they're with you? Do they love you when they're with certain other people? Do they hate you when they're with other people? Do they love you only when, when, the, when the atmosphere is right? When you're switching up and you are someone else, you're inconsistent. That statement is not of God. It is more of this world than you want to give yourself credit for. God is not into fickle character. He's into faithful character. I hope you heard that. We need to learn how to be reliable. But then number two underneath this fourth one, don't lend money to people and expect a return. It's a real simple rule of thought. And let's, let's write that verse number five. Look, real simple prin prin principle when you're dealing with money with other people. If you don't have it to give in such a way where you're not looking for it to come back. Don't give it at all. Don't give it at all. And I know, I know the Bible has plenty of passages that talk about how you can lend to each other. And it is biblical to lend and so on and so forth. And I know some of our money people right now are really, well, no, you can. The Bible, the word of God tells you you can lend. Yeah, yeah I, I hear you. But listen to me, practical folk, practical folk. If you can't give it away and not obsess over when you're going to get your $2 back. If you can't give it away and you're not hunting somebody down, and I gave them $5 last week, look at them over there at Starbucks. Look at them. They ain't gave my money back. And look at them over there at Starbucks. I know. I know that caramel macchiato costs a whole lot more than the $5. How come I ain't got my money back? I'm looking at them new Tims. How come I ain't got my money back? Oh, no, you didn't. You bust up in here in the brand new Jordans, in the new Jordans, in the new Jordans. You got the new Air Force One. You, you, you running through your mind on all that kind of stuff, worried about the little bit of money. Look, if you were going to do that before you gave it, why? I give it. What God is guarding against is the spirit of materialism and selfishness and consumerism that's in your heart that shows itself when things don't come back to you the way you gave it out to them. So if you can't give it out like God, 
don't give it out at all. God gives and he's not respecting a return. God gave his son, sacrificed his son, paid it. Debt is done. I'm not expecting you to give back what I gave you. Why? Because you can't. You cannot give back what I gave you. So in like fashion, all I want you to do is celebrate the gift. You and I ought to learn how to give in such a way and sacrificially give in such a way where it's not about a return. It's about the celebration of the gift God gave. And when you give like God, then you show it's all about you. The reason why I'm giving it is because it ain't mine anyway. Did you hear that? I didn't have no five dollars to give you. It's God's money. I got a little extra. He let me be a steward over a little extra. And what's mine, it was his, is in my holding. I'm going to give you what belongs to him. So if you do what you're going to do with it, blessed be the name of God. Really what you're looking for is for people to do more of what God has done through you when they bless other people. That's the goal. So don't lend expecting a return. Then watch number 11, the, the last one, the 12th one. Don't accept bribes. To hurt people. Real simple, be an advocate, not someone who's in alliance to hurt people. When you put all of these together, I'm, I, I'm done. When you put all of these together, what you find is that you and I can live in such a way where we are showing that it is all about him. That's why the end of the text says, when you and I do this, the, the free Bible version says, those who act like this will never fail. It ought to remind you of 2 Peter chapter 1. The, the, the International Children's Bible even says, whoever does all these things will never be destroyed. The New American Standard says at the end, he who does these things will never be shaken. The Passion Translation says they will never be shaken. They will stand firm forever. Thomas, what are you saying? I'm saying that when you and I live like this text is challenging us to live, we are telling God and the world it really is all about him. That's why I do what he says. I do what's right. I tell the truth. I don't lie. I don't want to wrong other people. I don't gossip. I don't celebrate with negativity, but I do honor the truth. I keep my promises. I don't switch up. I don't land expecting a return. And I don't accept bribes to hurt other people. Why? Because I'm living in such a way that says it's all about him. And when it's all about him, God will bless me in such a way that I will never, ever fail. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We bless you. And we praise you for being our God. We honor you for the way that you've honored us, for the privilege you've given us in understanding how to live for you and like you. We ask, oh God, that you bless the things that you've put before us. Father, I pray especially that you bless us to live in such a way where we have a people who have hearts like you want us to have, habits like you want us to have, wants like you want us to have, and ways like you would have us to live. Lord God, I pray that you bridle every aspect of who we are. Allow us to take this text and inculcate it in our lives so that your people may be magnified and your name may be magnified by the way we live among those who are with us. God, we honor you. We praise you. We bless you. We thank you so much for the privilege you've given us to be able to say that we belong to you. We ask that you get glory out of this day. We ask that you help us, Father God, to celebrate you in all of what we do. We ask, oh God, that you allow us to live in a way where we can shine and we can be a difference maker with those who are seeking you. Father, lead people to us so that we can illustrate and, and, and instruct them on the nature of who you are. God bless your world. Continue to heal it, strengthen, and allow us, Father God, to be renewed. And we pray, Father, that we want to live every single day just for you. We ask that you get glory and you get glory in such a way that you exhaust our lives doing so. In fact, oh God, use us up doing good. And when you and you alone are done, please bring us home. This we ask in Jesus' name as we together say and we together pray. Amen. And amen. Listen, it's all about him. This psalm very much stands as a, a, a text that can help shape our lives if we allow it. My prayer is that we do just that. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. I'm asking you, please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you.